One of the things I, I've taught my churches is I have a, a evangelism training program called We Are His Witnesses, in which I take churches through eight sessions of how to be a better witness for Christ as a church. And so it deals with a whole lot of stuff, whether it's some personal evangelism, how to do Bible studies, how to give Bible studies. One session we talk about conviction, because you know there is positive and negative conviction, and they both are good. And so when people see negative conviction on somebody, they tend to step away from it. That's good. You know why? Because they're fighting God. And as long as they're fighting God, God got a chance. Right? And so we so it's a whole host of that, but also condense it, right? Because some churches may not want to do eight weeks. You know, some churches may want to do just four. And that's fine too. So so what 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 we need to understand is that churches will die if they don't do evangelism. So let's pray together. Father, be with us as we begin. We pray for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's the last one with today. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Then I'm going to take you to a, a, a Bible story where I need you to do at the end. And I'm going to show you where my church started. Talk about it. I'm going to show you where we are now. If a church is not active in a community, a church is not going to be vibrant. Let me say it again. If a church is not active in its community, it's not going to be vibrant. You know why? Because it'll just have people who just drive in and drive out. Mm -hmm. And if you drive in and drive out, you have no stake in your community. You just hit a visit. The community, excuse me, the black church historically has been a bedrock for the community. It's been the place where historical black colleges have started. It's been the place where we've talked about our rights. It's been the place where the civil rights movement has been been met about and trained. So it's been the place. Schools closed, but churches don't. Mm -hmm. So the, the black church, especially, has to be a resource. Has to be what everybody? A resource. What I truly believe in, what I teach my church is we have to be a Walmart of our community. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? I'm glad you asked. What it means is when you go into Walmart, depending on what side you're going in, you can start on the grocery side. But then you go down towards the back, you, you, get, you get auto, you got school supplies, you got technology, you got cleaning supplies, you got uh, uh, beauty stuff. So any, you got clothing, anything you need at Walmart, you can get, amen? amen? You don't have to go any place else if you don't want to, because you get everything you need. Is that right, yes or no? Amen. The church has to be the Walmart in this community, meaning you have to be a resource for your community. Now, don't get quiet this whole time. Now. You have to be. You know why? Because people are struggling. And if they're struggling, they need to know where to go. One of my favorite quotes <clears throat> comes from Acts of the Apostle, page 9, where Ellen White says, The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. She said, It was organized for a service. And its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. Now, it's important. The most important thing in that for me is two things. It's what? Salvation for man. And it was organized for what? Service. How service oriented are we as a church? Come, come on, talk to me. It's your time. How service oriented are we? You know, the calendar has holidays, correct? Yeah. Fourth of July just passed. Labor Day is coming up. The church has holidays. Every year we do a backpack of free two supplies once a year, right? We have Christmas stuff once a year. We get ready for Easter or the resurrection once a year, right? We may have a health meeting once a year. So we have holidays too. The church is not supposed to operate like that. The church is supposed to be a service organization, which means if I asked Adamsville or Fairfield, hey, tell me what this community needs. You should be able to say the community needs grief counseling, the community needs parenting classes, the community needs substance abuse, the community needs mentoring and tutoring. You should be able to tell me that. 
If you can't tell me that, then you don't know your community. You with me so far? Mm -hmm. And until the church understands its community, it'll never grow. People not growing just because the seventh day is on Saturday. Mm -hmm. You can talk to a lot of people, they tell you that the seventh day is Saturday. Mm -hmm. But what you gonna do when they come in? And they got a host of resources, excuse me, problems that needs to be done, okay? So as you get into this today, the one thing I want you to take from this, if nothing else, you gotta change the way of thinking. You gotta change what? And how you do church. And what's the two? One is what? How we think. And how we do what? Can I tell you a secret that no one told you before? The church is not for you. It's for the community. So the service is supposed to be geared to bring them in because you're already in. Amen. Well, what do we do? We make all the services for who? For us. So you got to have a hand. You gotta have a fourth commandment. You gotta have this, gotta have that, gotta have all that, right? But a person come in, they don't know that stuff. And then we use Adventist jargon. When I came to the church, I had no idea what a, what a haystack was. I thought they were going to feed cows. Because my grandfather used to say, go over there and get that haystack and bring it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> right? So you have to change how you think and how you operate as a church. You know why my church started at 1230? You may want to know why? Why? Because people work hard all week now. I got one amen. <laughs> and listen, I'm big on optics. Optics. No one's coming to church at 915. When they ain't working 50 hours all week. So we said we got to meet our people where they are. So we, when I got there, we, I'm just going to talk to you. We was having church at 9, 9.30, 11 o'clock. It was three people in Sabbath school. Mm. The same three people get up every day at 4 a.m. <laughs> so I said, y'all, we can't do this. So we moved our Sabbath school to 11 a.m. My class alone, because I teach a class, my class alone has 20 people in it. Children's class is full. Adult class is full. We start church at 12.30. The Sabbath is all day. So we decided it's best to what? Change up the game. And we have much better success thus far with that. Yes, ma'am. Did you get any flack from conference officials? Why would I get flack from conference officials? Oh, that's not tradition. Who but cares? I'm just saying, did you? I did not. No. Who cares? No. And listen, you won't get any flack from conference officials. You know, I, I got flack from the... Uh, some of the super great hair old people who don't listen, there's this old cliche that older people, the older you get, you get more what? Stubborn. Yeah, it's a it's a nice way to say nice second way. <laughs> but you're stubborn. I got a mom. She's stubborn. And I tell her, I say, Johnny, I'm gonna whoop your butt if you don't move. Because I'm a, I'm the parent now, because I take care of my mother. <laughs> I say, you can't be stubborn with me. If I could be stubborn as a little boy. You can't be stubborn as an older mother, right? So the, the people that have the most problems are the ones who set their ways. Because they think that 11 o'clock is the divine hour and everything else beyond that is nothing. So we have to educate. And, 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 I, and I educate, right? So I educate my people. Because historically, the only reason we did 11 o'clock is because in 1844, when everybody started coming in, after the great disappointment, the folk were used to going 11 o'clock on Sundays. That's the only reason we did 11 o'clock. But you can't find 11 o'clock in the what? Hey Amen, somebody. Amen. So we, we started having common sense conversations. And common sense conversation is, hey, what's, what's going to be formidable for our church? Right? What's going to be formidable for our church and our community? And so our community likes the fact that we have a later church service. And we find that people are more energetic than not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't have to get up as early. That makes sense. 
Like, and the people don't have to rush. You know how many people argue on the way to church? Because somebody went late. I got a wife that moves at a woman's pace to get you out of sight. <laughs> ain't gonna set me up. <laughs> so I'm ready to go, God. And we only drive in one car. <laughs> Not because we have to, because that's the way it is. We need to drive it separately. But I have to let my wife know ahead of time, honey, we leaving at 10 o'clock, which means 10, 15. She don't know that because she will, I'm ready to go. You know how many people will argue going to the church, getting the kids ready because they got to be there at 9, 15? And I'm not suggesting you all. You got to do what's best for your church. I'm just telling you about my church, okay? So, so we had to change some things. And I want you to understand, you have to change what you think in doing church and how you see church. There's nothing wrong with that, all right? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with changing our methods, not our principles, okay? So before I get started on this, when you think of evangelism, what do you, what do you think about? What do you think about? What comes to mind? Since it's a bad this weekend, what do you think about? Huh? Outreach. Outreach, okay. What else? Reach and helping people, what else? Bringing people in, what else? Children's ministries. Children's ministry, all right. All right, what else? Revelation seminars. Now all these things that you're telling me are what? Different ministries, programs. Evangelism is lifestyle. In other words, it's part of who you all are, who you exist as. It's who you are every single day. We just have a title called evangelism. And the problem is we've made evangelism a process and not a lifestyle. Make sense? So if it's a process, then I got to put it on the calendar. I got to vote this, do this, do that. There are some churches who do events meeting all the time and don't bring nobody in. I don't do all that. I believe if you have a relationship with your community, they're going to wonder why, who you are, and they're going to start coming in. We're going to talk about what that means in a moment. What scares you about evangelism? Or makes you hesitant? That it might fail. Excuse me. That it might fail in the beginning when you start, it might fail. Oh, yeah. Damn, mm -hmm. it's can't believe it. That it may fail. Okay. What else? <laughs> the cost factor. All right. What else? What else? It may fail. The cost. What else? You don't know what kind of fish might come in. Oh, you don't know what kind of fish you're going to get. Mercy. You got not enough that more from That's help. a good answer. Not enough more. Say again. Okay. Okay. Tax or state. All right. All right. What else? Rejection. Huh? Rejection. Rejection. What else? She said boots on the ground. Boots on the ground. Lack of or need to. Lack of. Lack of. Lack of boots on the ground. All right. What else? How you going to meet their needs? How you going to meet their needs? All right. What else? Yes, sir. Follow up. Follow up. All right. Anything else? Yes. All right, what else? The aftermath. The aftermath. All right, what else? What else? You had your Bibles, right? I'm going to show you something in a moment, right? All those are human frailties. How often was Jesus rejected? Many times. Did he stop? No, he didn't stop. So why are we worried about rejection? Who do you think they rejected? Christ. They're not rejecting you. No. And they're really not rejecting it. You, all you're doing is planting a seed. A rejection is a plant seed. But see how we look at everything, we base it on who? On us. God has never asked you to be responsible for the finances. He asked you responsible for what? Faithfulness. Being faithful. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things be added unto you. See, we have so many hang-ups as to why we don't do it. It may not, it may not succeed. How many people did Jesus baptize? None. Zero. Nobody. Nobody. How many people did Noah baptize? Nobody. Nobody. 
but yet they still get over. There was success. So, so you have to understand that as a body of believers, your mindset has to change. It has to change. The other thing is time. People don't have enough time with that. Let me give you a startling fact. Because I want the eyes to kick in on y'all. There are 168 hours in the week. Correct? Yeah, 24. <laughs> Times seven. So, y'all with me, right? Yeah. I mean, I love math. So 168 hours in a week. Correct? If I spend 40 hours, if I spend eight hours a day sleeping, how, how many hours is that? 56, eight times seven. All right? 56 minus 168 is what? 112. All right? If I spend 40 hours working a normal job, 40 minus 112 is what? 72. Right? If I spend three hours a day with family, three times seven is 21. 21 minus what? 72 is what? 51. If I spend three hours to myself, that's 21. 21 minus 51 is what? 30. So there's 30 hours still a week to do what? Ministry. The Adventist church is open half a day every week. If prayer meeting, and Sabbath, Sabbath school, church, potentially a Y. So if we're the remnant, why are we closed 95% of the time? If we get all the Bible truth, why are we closed 95% of the time? So 95% of Seventh-day Adventist churches in America is closed during the week. Why is that, y'all? We still got 30. I put everything in there. Working, sleeping, playing, family. Okay, let's say you binge. Three hours a day on Netflix. Prime Video, Apple TV. That's, that's still, you still got, what, nine hours left to do what? Work for God this week. I done gave you everything. <coughs> and you don't want to make time. You know we don't make time? Not talking to you, but the souls of people not that important. Mm. The souls of people not important that more, no more. If we believe that Christ is coming and we're not doing our part, we're saying that we don't believe that the second coming is coming. So when I got to New Covenant, New Covenant was bare bone in the community. We were, we were known as the church by the graveyard. Which means what? We we known as the dead church in the community. Now they were good at singing and a little preaching. But you can't keep nobody with that. So here comes this guy who's been recruited to be the community guy. And now I'm going to show you a clip of what we do now. The church was dead when I got there. So I concentrated on Isaiah 58. And the White says Isaiah 58 is the chapter that we should review over and over and over again. It's the message for this generation. Not the one cry loud and spare not. Not that one. Not, but verses 5 through 8. Where we are to help those in need. So I'm going to show you this. You know, dally a little bit in, in the scripture. I'm going to talk about what really it takes to create liveliness. Now, when I got there, no media team, no nothing. My media guy is a school psychologist, but we believe in deep ministry. And we had 25 people there. And of the 25, only three was willing. Do you know what I said? We do a food drive every third 
Saturday. That's our church service. We feed up to 600 families. We give them that much for food. And we get at least 15 Bible stories. We do blood drives. We do expungement clinics. Right? I've collaborated with 25 different organizations to help me. I just remember this, the health department because in that community where I'm at, there's a big, high population of STDs, HIV. So we're going to do a big uh, health so we can what? Get people tested. So guess what they're going to, guess, guess what they say who covenant is now? New covenant is the church that will help you. Call them, they help you. See, we got to change how people see us. Because most of us, they just see that's them folk going to church when? On Saturday. And that's it. So the first part of this, the, the video about six minutes, the first part of this is my media director reading about Isaiah 58. Then you'll see all this stuff we do. Every first, every first Sabbath, we have an Isaiah 58 Sabbath, in which we have a short service. We dress down, we have an Isaiah 58 t-shirts on that day. And we go into the community with a variety of different ministries. One is called Bridge and Threads, which is our homeless population. Another we go to the bus station where people have not eaten in days. And, and at that Bridge and, and Threads, we, we have a backpack where we fill it with undergarments, toothpaste, soap, towel, and a lunch. All right? Deodorant, things of that nature. And then we have hot dog and a hug in the park. So in order to get a hug, hot dog, you got to give a hug. Then on that hug, we give you a trap. Right? We have drive-through prayer. Where you can, we had a major light. We got the prayer sign. We go to Kroger on Sabbath. We give them folk food cards. We fill it up people's cards for gas. Right? What are we trying to do? We're trying to build a relationship. Because once we build a relationship, then we can get them to what? Trust us that these folk got something. And guess what? I don't have no millionaires in my church. I got all blue-collar people. I got all blue-collar people. And we spend money every month, about $50,000 for ministry every month. Your ministry. Because I've, and let me tell you what God has done. God has brought money in. Mm -hmm. One family gave me $15,000 just to help people. A guy saw how our food lines are. My wife was taking water. We were taking water. They say, Pastor, I don't need you walking. He bought a $10,000 golf cart. He lets you for us to use. God brings in money. One, one couple stopped in in December and said, we appreciate what y'all do. Because listen, I don't care who in the building. I'm going to let them know what we do. Left $5,000 for ministry. And we have not faltered yet. Amen. And we just bought four air conditioners that cost $95,000. The church was scared. We had ten thousand in the bank left, and they, you know how to, you know how to, you know how to get the, the penny pictures. Pastor them spent all the money. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Yes. <laughs> we had a board meeting last week. We got fifty one thousand, and they like, where it come from? I said, Amen. Look, Amen. Just look up. Yeah. Amen. Did anybody get up? Listen, I tell my treasure. I don't need treasures in here, but I told you the treasure. I like you. I told my treasure when I got that I'm going to spend all the church money on ministry but God going to bring it back Amen. and she stands up and says he right I may not like it but he sure enough spend it I sure do on ministry you need some help we got you and God is not short of us so let's so, so go ahead and play the video and then I'll answer some questions and we're going to dive into a little bit more you, you'll see my wife and she does. Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud. Don't be timid. Tell my people of their sins. Every day. 
this year we focusing on change. Everything dealing with God has to do with change. The Bible tells us in Corinthians, Behold, by beholding, we become changed. Everything dealing with God has to do with change. Let's go! Be the change. I came in contact with Pastor Jackson and you coming to church, I come to the food uh, pantry, the food pantry, and I was like, Pastor, I need a ramp for my mom. He was like, we can help you. I would like to thank the founders here at this church and the flock and body that have made today's expungement clinic for our community possible. Today, many, many people within this community were helped with jobs, were helped with reinstatement of rights, and helped with criminal court matters. They were met with help today. Well, there's a critical need for blood in our area, especially for people who have sickle cell, a rare blood disease. Now, the church is doing its part by partnering with the American Red Cross. Each one of you have to decide that. Now, my wife and I 
are the leaders of my church. Well, I go, she go. Right? So when they see me, they see her. Right? And they appreciate my, my, my first lady, my wife. Because she works just as hard as I do. She's just in the back. So when they see us working together, man, it gives them excitement. Because they see a team. My wife, my, she's my teammate. Right? So, so they see the time that we give. They in turn said, we got to get some time too, right? Even when we had small babies. So, so the first thing, each one of you got to determine how much time you're willing to give. Whether it's 10 hours in a week, three hours in a week, whatever it may be. That's the first thing you got to determine. How willing are we as a church to see this thing continue? Because here's what I told the New Covenant. Your legacy will die if we don't change something. And here's the hard part. They're going to move me to another church. That's what's going to happen. Where she'll be here. I'm only appointed for a certain amount of time. Whereas you're here permanently unless you move. So if you want your legacy to die, then you got to do something about it. That's the first thing. The second thing is you got to ask yourself, what do we do well? What do we, what do, we do well? Now I heard of the puppet ministry. Right? Is it mascot? Yes, I'm mascot. Mascot ministry, okay. Thank you. All right? That's for kids. What do you have for adults? So you got something to attract the kids, but not the adults. So if a child gives his or her life to Christ, they only have a 4% chance of the family coming in. If a father do, it's 90%. If a mother do, it's 34%. Okay? So the second thing is, you got to have something that attracts what are you to what you're good at? What are you good at? What do you want to be known for? And you don't have to do a whole lot of stuff. We did one thing for one, two years to get it right. Because I do believe if people don't see success, they'll give up. Okay? We just had our annual uh, back to school. So here's what I do. Because I came from poverty, I make everything free. And you know, some of them admins don't like that. So I had a food truck out there, and an ice cream truck out there, and we gave away 260 backpacks full of school supplies, and it was 400 people out there, and we fed everybody, and gave them free ice cream. So they they used to, Nate says, used to be loud about it. They're not loud no more because they lose their influence. I'll take an ice cream truck right next door to me is a community. A low income community, low, low housing, excuse me. I take the ice cream truck, my wife and I with, with my team, we walk through the neighborhood and come on and get some ice cream. I'm pitching to them that we're relational. So we're good at relationships. Okay? We got a blood drive coming up on Monday. We have a job fair every other every other month. We have we hire people on the spot. We have a 20 percent where 350 people show up. So you got to do something good first. That's the, that's the second thing. The third thing is, you got to put your money where your mouth is. That means you got to be faithful in tithes and offerings. More particularly, offerings. You know why? Because the tithe leaves here and goes to where? The conference office. And you may get a percentage back if you got a bonus in your tithe. But you gotta, get, you gotta be faithful. So what we have, we, we call it the Gideon 300. Gideon had 300 men. So every fifth Sabbath, everybody has to bring in. Everybody is being asked to bring in an additional $300 above their giving. So in other words, that means you gotta put away $25 a week for the, until the next fifth Sabbath. That means, listen, some of y'all go out and eat every week and it costs more than $25. Ain't that right? Yeah. Come on, talk to me. Don't get to say, I knew y'all was going to do that when I said 300 yeah. Well, when I go out and eat with my wife, and I, it's $52. So you mean to tell me I can't put, and we, and we date every week. You mean to tell me I can't put up $25 for myself a week? So by the time the fifth Sabbath comes, it's $300 there for ministry? You ain't got to worry about it if you can afford it or not. So those three things you have to do. Then the fourth thing, you have to tailor 
your ministries around the folk in your community and then the, the unconverted in your church. You got, you got these kids here. I don't know if they're part of your mascot. I, I, so I noticed that there was a lot of uh, monitors thrown away. I guess they don't work anymore. Right? I, I, I watch everything, right? So you got to have something for them to do beyond Sabbath school. Amen. 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 Because that's sin. If if she has <clears throat> all of you, children, <laughs> just say yes for the sake. If she's a single mother, I don't, I don't know if she's single or not. That's not my business. If she's a single mother with all these kids, and they have something for her kids, and they're excited about going, guess what she's gonna do to her? She's gonna get excited. She's gonna get curious. What y'all got going on over there? And then because you got something for adults, man, you get mama and her and her baby eggs. Amen? Amen. That's evangelism. We deduce evangelism to just be a meeting down in Revelation for health. That's not evangelism. Evangelism is a lifestyle. The church school is supposed to be evangelistic. It's operated right. Lord, forgive me. Right? So, your, your, your church service, evangelistic. So, if you, those four things, without it, and we can see if you wrote it down, number one is what? Willing mind. Huh? Willing mind. Willing mind. Second one is what? How much time? You're going to commit to ministry. What's the third one? What you good at. What are you good at? What are, what are we good at? See, see, in my board, I mean, we don't spend time just voting for stuff. We strategize. So we spend time talking, okay, what are we good at? Fourth thing is, what's the last one? Faithful finance. Faithful finance. You got to have, have something that you know your, your folk can give. And then the fifth one? Taylor. Tell your ministries around those who are not what? Church members. And don't tell them what you like. Amen? <laughs> Listen, I've had a Super Bowl party in my church. And I, and I had a Super Bowl party the day that the, they had the all type of Dr. Dre, Dr. Dre on. <laughs> <laughs> and Mary J. Blythe with them long legs came on. And the, and the men, and we was in a fellowship hall, but the man was glued. <laughs> <laughs> but, but guess what? We had a Super Bowl party. Because there are wives whose husbands do not attend church. And they think our church is weird. We're a Super Bowl party. The ladies cooked for us. Then they got out. And we was there, about 20 of us. Gave the men something to do. You with me so far? Mm -hmm. You can't always tailor it just for you. All right? Make sense so far? Yeah. <laughs> and if you tailor it only for you, and they don't last long. The sixth thing is you need to survey your community. You do what? Survey. What do you mean by that? Here's what you so I have a team of 35 people in seven different areas. Because our church decided we want to minister in a two-mile radius. Why two mile radius? You might know. So people can walk the church. If they don't have a car, they can walk. We bought a church van so we can pick up people. We want people to also walk the church. So in a two mile radius, we have seven areas where we're targeting getting information about how to do ministry. So, so there are questions on a survey sheet that teams go in and say, hello, how you doing, sir? What's your name? Uh, yeah. Hi, Jeff, I'm Corey Jack from the Covenant Church. I got 30 seconds. I just, wanna, I just wanna know, can you help me what we can do for this community? Can I take 30 seconds? Sure. 10 questions, he tells me, and, and the questions are already there. Do you think we need health in this community? Do we think we need grief counseling? Parenting classes? Any need for Bible studies? He said, definitely. And then when we get done, do you mind if we pray with you? Oh, yeah. So now we take that back. And we put together a grief program. Because we had enough people who said they need a grief counseling. We put parenting classes. And when they come to the church, they, they want to know why do we go to church on Saturday? Now we can say, 
We got Bible studies on Wednesday at 6 15 for the public. So I'm doing meetings all the time as a part of my life. My children's ministry leader looking to start a Pathfinder group with our community. She don't know nothing about Pathfinder. We got a lot of kids. She don't know nothing about it. She about this tall. I promise you. So, so that's where it starts. So now you got So then once you get that information back, guess what you can do now? You can determine where the ministries need to take place. Amen? Amen. Yeah. It's not even hard. At first, I'm going to bring you a lot of PowerPoints. I ain't doing all that. I said, listen, it's simple. But you got to be willing. All right? Any questions so far? I'm going to wrap up in a moment. Any questions for me so far? No questions? Come on, Adventist. You got to ask me something. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What, what, uh... I'm going to repeat your questions you asked of me. Recorded. Uh -huh. What's your best uh, tool for survey? Best tool for survey. So I created my own. I can I can send one to your pastor, but it's it's uh it's 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 just a generic community survey. That's all it is with, with a bunch of questions that a community member would want to potentially answer. All right, and we tailor it for the community, and we found that people don't mind saying what's wrong. And they want to be involved. And they even feel more important when they find out the church want to know what you need. Because most times, what do we do? We tell them what they need compared to them telling us what they need. Like, what are we so far? All right? Any other questions? Yes? How do you handle a big situation where you have a, you know, a small community like this? And I, I grew up, I, I grew up in my day. Oh, okay. So uh, basically, everybody, like, you go take a or something, everybody in the community know who you are, what you're doing, automatically. That's how, I mean, that's how all the time. I mean, we had several pastors came through here and be like, back to this work? Uh -huh. They said, don't, they, all of them told me they came through, don't be going back to this work. And this is what happened to me. When you do back to this work, you expand the area. Okay. So you have more people. So how do you be able to be dealing with the uh, community that no close to it? Then you go to one door, everybody in the community know you. Then the pastor, then on Sunday, the pastor be up and stuff like that. Okay. You got to outsmart them. First, first you got to start praying. Second thing you got to do is do something that's um, that's generic in terms. So, which, so you do health. Everybody, everybody got health issues. So do a health seminar. It needs to be regular, right? So, so you got to do things that will meet people there, especially if there's a bias, yeah. right? So you can have an after-school tutoring program. Right? You can have VBS and then have some for the adults, have an adult VBS. Right? So, so you have to be able to do something that, that, that does not interfere with they, what they, and then you gotta, we pray twice a day. We pray at 6 a.m. as a group, as a church, excuse me, and 6 p.m. God can break down these walls. You don't need to go outside of Adamsville if you haven't conquered Adamsville. Right? Because he said start where? In Jerusalem? Jen? Mm -hmm. Then? Judea? Then? Samaria? Then the uttermost part. So you got to start where you at. But you can do a health seminar on a regular. Right? I was in Columbus, Mississippi, and they do something every Tuesday, and it'd be jam-packed. Listen, here, here's the problem. And hear me clearly. Here's the problem with us. As soon as we tell somebody we want to baptize them right away, no, you got to build a relationship with people. <laughs> It takes time and consistency. And what else? What they used to seeing is the church open once a week, and that's it. But if they know that you have a health program every Tuesday dealing with black folk stuff, diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, right? What's the rest of them? Overeating. Overeating. Overweight, right? Uh, what's, what's some more about black stuff? What's the, Cancer. Cancer. Cholesterol. If you listen, that's ten, that's that's eight weeks right there. That's two months. Hey y'all, we having a, a simple we having a lecture and we have an education on diabetes. You get three people here so much. If you make it so good, those three people don't tell everybody they came in contact with you. You follow me? 
We got to stop trying to just preach the Sabbath. We ain't preached nobody yet. In a book called Christian Service, page 119, Ellen White says, the Savior's method alone will bring true success to ministry. She said he mingled with people, he sympathized, he ministered to their needs, he won their confidence, then he told them to follow me. You gotta have some mingling ministries. There's something in this community that everybody suffers with, that you have to meet them where they are. Do you know how many people have died in this community? We don't ever do anything for grief. There are folk who are divorcing left and right. We never do anything with divorce. Am I right? And so we got to get outside of the box and stop thinking all we got to do is a what? A Daniel or Revelation seminar. You can have a cooking class. Who made that vegan uh, salad dressing today? What's well, Sister Bass? I, 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 need, I, I need to kiss her on my cheeks. Because <laughs> most people, is she vegan herself? I'm saying, is she, is she a vegan herself? Yes. Yeah. That's why most people who try to get vegan, they mess it up. And I have to just, I have to just choke it down. <laughs> but you can have a healthy cooking class. My children's ministry, they got kids cooking in the kitchen. We're really teaching kids this age to cook. Amen. 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 Kids cooking in the kitchen. Right? Because listen, most females don't want to cook today. Y'all know that, right? <laughs> My son, we dated some girls. Like, dad, she can't cook. I said, leave that joke alone. <laughs> she can't cook, leave her alone. Because the quickest way to a man's heart is his what? Stop his stomach. <laughs> if she can't cook, leave that joke alone. I don't care how fine she is, how pretty she is. What she got in the front and the back. She can't feel your middle. <laughs> leave her alone. <laughs> right? And so, and so... Cooking is something that can be done. You can have that once a week. Have 10 minutes of, of, of 15 minutes of lecture about why it's important to eat healthy, and then let them practice cooking. There are a lot of colleges who partner with churches to do that because they believe in healthy cooking. But if you're a church that only goes to church on Saturday, you're never partnering with them. The other success we have is I partner with a lot of organizations. I am a, a person who collaborates. So my church gives me money to take people out to eat. Amen. Amen. So I can meet them on the golf course because it's still a business. Yeah. I'm a businessman who's selling the gospel for free. Amen. That's what I am. What's your business? Man, I'm in the sales. How much is it going to cost? Free. They want it. It's curious. Right? So, after you get your survey, then you put it all together. Then you start putting in what I gotta do to be done. Makes sense? Makes sense so far? Amen. I guarantee your church will grow. I guarantee you, it won't be like this. I guarantee you have life in it. The last piece I'm gonna tell you before I give you a Bible study is your church has to have curve appeal. That's how what? Curb appeal. What does curb appeal mean? Look good from the outside yeah. and the inside. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm not from Birmingham. I think I went to one Walmart uh, here. Now, is there a ghetto Walmart around here? <laughs> <laughs> by, your, by your laughter, you know exactly what I'm saying. So, so there's a ghetto Walmart, is that right? <laughs> it's who? Well, wait, wait, I'm going to go somewhere. <laughs> But there's another Walmart you go to. Why, why don't you go to that Walmart? Because it's got it, right? You get in there, folks look at you like, what you doing here? You're like, you're supposed to be like, hello. There's stuff everywhere. It's nasty. And so most people aren't going there. They'd rather drive an extra 10 minutes away to go to one that's what, clean? And walk in the Walmart. Glad you're here. You ready to spend money after that. Am I right? You gotta decide what does your church look like? To get a Walmart? Or does it look like the Walmart that you want people to come in? 
Does your house look better than the church? That's a problem. And the wife mentions that the church looked the best on the block. It is God's place of habitation with his people. Amen. People will judge you by two things. Your website, if you have one, or and your church when they drive by. If they see don't see either one, they'll say you don't care about church. We spent a lot of money with our website. Can you can you pull it up up here for me? We spent a lot of money with our website because that's how people. It's, it's newcovsda.com. That's how people judge you if they're gonna come to your church or not. That is your website. They look and see if you have online presence. My wife was disappointed today because whenever I'm not with her, she like to watch me online. And I was like, honey, they online. She's like, SMH. I can't see my husband today. Right? So, so, so curb appeal plays a big part. If you rate your church one to five, five being excellent, one being needs a lot of work, what would this church be? Be, be honest. Somebody said two, three. Dot com, dot com. Yeah, dot com. I got you, Pastor. You got me? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. N E W, uh uh. C O V S D A dot com. Yeah, C O V. Yes, yeah. Take out the N. Yeah, N E W, C O V, then S D A. Yeah, take off the. Yeah, yeah, keep going back. Now take out the N N E W C O V S D A. Yeah, C O V, yep, yeah, S D A dot com. So when you come on our website, that's what it looks like. Hit that Xbox, yeah, it's my wife and I. But this is what it looks like. And, and we spent a lot of time because our motto is on here. So that's our church doing our food drive. And so we, we pride ourselves on teaching. All right. That's my class that I teach. It's no, it's no sound to it. Proud of ourselves on serving. All right, my wife there, a uh, cute self. All right, so we serve. We have community baby showers. We have programs for our children. Then we unleash our members to do their work. All right, whatever it is, and that's our praise service every week. So, so, so right there, we already trying to grab the attention. A folk. Right. And let them know we are a new covenant. And then you can go to any place on there. We got a store, we sell our t shirts. Alright? So so when people go to our website, the first thing they're gonna say is what them folk got something that's sparking our curiosity. Image is everything. So when I told them I got to the church, everything was wrong with the building. So the whole church has been redone and refurbished. The sanctuary, the, the sanctuary it had a, a, a V for the pulpit. I said, what in the world? It had a V. I said, so I put in a whole new stage. There's TVs everywhere. There's speakers everywhere. You're in the bathroom, doing your thing, you're going to hear what's going on. <laughs> you ain't going to miss a beat with us. Every room got speakers. Did you know Adventists like to hang out? So check me out. I'm just going to talk to you. If, if we find out that you're in a, in a room too long, we turn the speakers real loud. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's segmented. 
so I can control it. So I'll be like, so, so, so I'll say, hey, turn up, turn up in the bathroom. Get them out of there. <laughs> Every place is segmented. You know what I'm saying? So, so what I want you to understand is we have curve appeal. I bought a digital sign. Now, I think your pastor put in for a digital sign for both churches. People see a digital sign, they see a lot. So, curve appeal means everything. Can I be honest before I leave? About the church? Can, can I be honest? I've been to both of them. Can I be honest though? I'm going to do it at the end. Because I believe in being honest. Okay? And then we'll start recording. And then we'll be honest. But curve appeal means everything. Amen? Amen. Amen. I pick the hotel I stay in. I'm a Hilton. I'm a Hilton's man. I don't stay at Hampton Inn unless I have to. It's a 3.5 hotel. But I'm going to pick the hotel that has the, the best amenities for me. Yeah. Right? I'm a diamond member. Right? I get, I get $15 food credit. Hampton Inn don't do that for me. Right? So I'm going to go where I get the best amenities. People want to go to get the best amenities. Exodus 3. And I'm, I'm going to get out of here because the pastor panty about, about a minute. <laughs> <laughs> the treasure's not there. <laughs> <laughs> Exodus 3. Exodus 3. <gasps> Exodus 3. This, this is going to deal with your willingness. Exodus 3. One through eight, but I'm not going to go through all of them. This deals with your willingness. Because the first thing I said is, in order to, to, to be different, you got to what? Change the way you what? Think. Think and how you see, how you see church. You got to change the way you see it. Right? You got to. That's the first thing, that's the first thing you got to do. You got to change the way, it, it, it has to change. But it takes willingness. Exodus chapter three, Moses on the backside of the mountain, Right with the sheep, he sees a fire of a bush that's not being what everybody? It's not being consumed. All right. He says, "I'm gonna go see this sight," and as he gets to the sight, God says to him, "What? Take up your shoes. Because you're on holy ground." Right. Now, when most people hear that. The first thing they think about is what? Reverence. Right? And I'm not trying to discard that that's not the case. But I want to, I want to take your mind to a different plateau. What kind of man was Moses in Exodus chapter 2? What kind of man was he? Huh? He was a murderer. What else was he? What, what, he, he had premeditated murder. Right? What else was he? He had a temper. What else about Moses? He stuttered. He stuttered. What else about him? He was an exile. He, he, before that, he ran. So now he's a murderer, but he's scary. How you gonna run? Right? What's the other part? He's conniving. He buried the man, and the Bible says he looked this way, and he looked that way. And then he buried the man. So it tells you he looked dirty. He leaves, gone for 40 years. God catches him at age 80. Huh? Moses is a man who has, is used to doing what he wants, when he wants, because nobody told him what to leave. No one told him to kill. No one told him any of that. So God says, I need you to come what? Close to me, but I need you to take your shoes off. Yeah. Shoes in the Bible represents directions. So Moses had to take his shoes off to indicate what? No longer am I going in what? My direction. But we're going God's direction. And it wasn't until God saw Moses take his shoes off that, Mo that God told him who he was. If you think I'm lying, read it. After he took his shoes off, he says, I'm the God of who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He had to prove first that he's what? Willing to be what? Led by God. So in other words, he had to check, take his shoes off. Let me tell y'all this. I'm big on documentary. Anybody see the Netflix documentary on the greatest pop song ever made? We Are the World song? Yeah, I've seen it. 
Quincy Jones wanted to bring all these singers together. They wanted Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder and Lionel Richie to write the song. Stevie Wonder didn't want to do it at first. But when Michael Jackson and, and Lionel Richie, I mean, Stevie, Lionel Richie started writing the song, and he brought all these folks together after a Grammy show. As they came through the door, he put something, as soon as they walk in, they can see. And he had mega stars. And what he put on the door was, check your ego at the door. See, in order for your church to grow, you got to check your ego at the door. Amen. What does that look like? That means I'm taking my shoes off. you taking your shoes off. And we're saying, God, wherever you send us in whatever direction, we walk in. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Then he can introduce who he is. Then he can tell you your mission. Somebody read verse 8 for me. Somebody read verse 8 for me. Read what you're preaching for. Verse 8. Verse 8. I am come down to deliver them. I have come down to do what? Deliver. Deliver. Who? Out of the hand of the Egyptians. Who was in the hands of the Egyptians? The Israelites. The Israelites. The Israelites. They were enslaved. The Hebrews, they were enslaved. Oh, yeah. He says, I've come down to deliver them. And what else? What else are you going to do? And to bring them up. Come on. From that land unto a good land oh. and a large. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. All the mites. Right? So God says, I'm coming to do what? Deliver. Two deliver. things. I'm coming to deliver people and give them what? A place that they can, a better place. You know, see, if you would have understood what I'm going, you would have said, Amen. I've come to set people free from the the preacher mentioned it during prayer time that are imprisoned. I've come to set them free and give them a better opportunity. But I can't do it, Moses, if you're not going to take your shoes off and let you lead and let and let me lead you. See, see, they can look at you because you can identify with them. That's right. I can do it, but you identify better with them because you want them. But Moses, I got to trust that you'll take your shoes off and let me lead you and take you because I want to deliver some folk. Right. Now listening to me? Amen. See, if your ego not checked at the door, y'all going to be arguing with me, arguing about this, arguing about that, arguing about this, and yet and still, you ain't going nowhere. Mm. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Go to Luke 418. Luke 418. Luke 4 18. Luke 4 18. Luke 4 18. Luke 4 18. Somebody read that from me. Luke 4 18. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, okay? Because you have anointed me mm -hmm. to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind. To sit in liberty, them that are bruised. So God says there are four people, four people groups that, uh, five people groups that, that he needs liberty. Number one is the who? What's the first one? Poor. Poor. Poor in spirit. That's materially and spiritually. The second one is? Broken hearted. Broken hearted. Those who are bitter. The next one? Captives. The captives, those who are, who are what? Captives of Satan. The next one? The blind, those who can't see spiritually. The fifth one, those who have been what? Discouraged because of sin. The same thing he told Moses, Christ said it differently. That's your mandate right there. Your job is to free folk, not just worship. Your job is to free folk, not just worship. Worship only comes with freedom. You didn't hear what I said. See, David danced because he was what? Victorious. That's the reason he danced. He didn't dance because the music was going. There was victory that was won. You can't dance if there's no victory. You can't dance if you're still discouraged, depressed, and down and out. Dancing only occurs when victory is won. Are y'all with me? So your job, my job, is to free them very folks that's in that passage 
and some of them right in the church. Mm. And when you when you make that your concentration, as you trying to come together, then I guarantee you folks start coming because now you pro you provide a safe place for people. See the the addict got to be able to say, man, I got some addictions I need prayer for. Right now, nobody gonna do that. Mm. Nobody gonna sit and say, you know what? My name is Boris Carlisle. I'm addicted to porn. He, if he ever said that, y'all be looking like Mr. President. Hit that proof. Quickly. Instead of saying, hey man, let's pray, let's lay hands on him, let's walk with him. If, 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 this, if this head elder is a gambler, he can't tell nobody. His wife knows, but he can't tell nobody. Because then they're looking like, how do the head elder? And you gamble, they'd be like, keep the money away from him. <laughs> so how do you think he feels? So he suffered in what? Silence. Why would anybody want to join a place like that? Well, let's say all these her kids, and they'd be like, man, how you got so many kids? And all of them got different daddies. I ain't saying you out there like that, though. Okay? <laughs> like, man, she got a lot of baby daddies. See how... How do you think she gonna feel? Oh, he's a foster care kid. Yeah, I know. Right. But ain't your daddy over there? Like, he is. Don't worry, he is. All right. But you see what I'm saying? Then he feels like, why would I want to be here if I feel like an outsider? We have to make people feel safe. <coughs> That's evangelism. Evangelism is your life. Now, there's certain things you need to be trained on, of course. But you don't have to be trained on being nice, being kind, <laughs> being patient. All right, any questions before I cut the tape? Tell me my observations. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Don't you think some people do need to be trained on being nice, being kind, and being patient? I don't know. That's a, that's a character issue. I'm just no, you can't train being nice. It's a, it's, a, it's a character problem. It's not a work problem. What do you do with it, though? Don't I'm put them in the front door. <laughs> <laughs> Keep in the basement somewhere. <laughs> Give them always something to do away from people, amen, <laughs> until they get it together. Listen, my greeter, her breast is out here. When you come to the church, she hugging everybody. Husband and wife. And I tell them, I said, listen, she's going to hug your husband. Don't take it personal. She put everything, hey. <laughs> <laughs> she hugged women like that. Hey. <laughs> I love that in the front door. <laughs> I say, Rose, come hug her. She knows exactly what that means. You can't have mean people. Listen, you have to confront it. See, the problem is, listen to me closely. We only confront certain sins. So if somebody working on Sabbath, or somebody have a baby out of the way of life, we love to confront that. But that mean, cantankerous person will say, oh, that's just the way he is. Mm -hmm. And he stay that way, and he going to go to hell being that way. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, yo, jock, you are a mean, we need to pray for you. <laughs> right? We don't do that. We got to be, listen, the Bible says iron shock is iron. That's right. That's right. Right? That's what it says, Proverbs 27, 17. So how can I sharpen you if I'm only, I'm only petting your sin? But we do that. Yes, sir. No, I was just going to mention, as you said that, I remember uh, I had a professor who, who his face didn't smile, and he always looked like he had a frown on his face. And at the end of the year, some of his students were like, hey, um, you know, I didn't think you were approachable. I never knew I could talk to you, um, but you're actually a good guy. And he said, why? He said, because you never smiled. I thought you had a problem with me. Right. You know, and so it's not that he was cantankerous, it's just that. Yeah, I look. They don't, they, sometimes they're not aware of it. Yeah, right. and, and, and you have to tell them. You got to tell them, yeah. So that's what you said. You can't train nice because they only going to last so long. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it has an expiration date, right? So, so we have to just do a better job in being friendly people in general. Here's what I tell people. The church is reflective of its leadership and its people. If the people are friendly, everybody around there going to be friendly. When I got the new covenant, nobody was hugging, nobody was, nobody was smiling. Now, we, man, we're a playful church. You're like, man, who's the pastor? I don't know, right? Because we have such a good time. Our, our claim of fame is we want to enjoy every moment we are together. See, even with my prayer meetings, now I have two prayer meetings, one at 12 o'clock 
for our seniors who don't want to drive at nighttime, and then at nighttime, it's our young adults, mainly who come out. And so folk don't want to leave. At 12 o'clock, they don't want to leave. It's, it's one that's not over. You seen the other ones? It's not over. Thank you. Right? And so at 7 o'clock, folk don't want to leave. They're not trying to get up there because we are very social and a church of fellowship. Right? right. So, so that makes people feel safe as well. Okay? Acts 2.42. They talk, they fellowship, they ate together, they prayed. So we take simple things from the Bible and make it part of our lifestyle. If church is not part of your lifestyle, ministry sure enough won't be. Evangelism is part of our lifestyle at the end of the day. All right? It's part of who we are. It's like work. It's part of our DNA. All right? Thank you, sir. You are a scholar and a gentleman today. Uh, Pastor, some of, the, some of the ministries we do, um, if they start bringing in a lot of people, what, what do you do? You know, and you can't handle the, you know, the, the crowd. What do you do? So if you can't handle the crowd, so what we do, yeah. we have a, um, I have a new life class that I teach for. We have spiritual guardians that we assign people, and we keep people involved. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so, so our job is to grow and to help others. So we like to have. So listen, <laughs> we had 400 people at our school supplies, and that included fire department and as well as the police officers. So every month. We go to the fire department and the police department, we pray for them, and we leave them stuff they like, donuts, snacks, and all that. So we invite them to be part of our community. So we train them. Yeah, because you know, what I'm asking this, I could remember a long time ago, uh, we went, it's like an encouragement when you get up to about 100 people to start up a new church, because what we're doing is church. Right. And not so much as, uh, you know, right. yeah, that's why, you know, so, so you need to be, so the church needs to be mission minded, right? How many can fit in this sanctuary? Anybody know? How many? 150. So, so, so you can say at a certain point, then we're going to have a new church. But you got to have stabilized church first here. You, you, you can't have 100 people and then 75 go over there and then you back. That's the way Right. But, and so, and so, what well, well, we decided is how many people each year do we want to try and baptize? And that's what we work towards. So you have a number goal. We have a number goal. And we make it, we don't, we don't say we want 50 people. Just, ah, man. Right? So we want to be honest about, and we strategize how to get there. All right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, don't forget you're going back with me, so I'm, you don't need no luggage. <laughs> you're going just as you are. All right? We, I, I, it's like everything you need. It's something like lemon. Everything you need, one penny. <laughs> this man. My church got used to us always being online. Nothing's online. Mm. Prayer meetings in person. Board meetings in person. Everything's in person. See, the more you keep people online, the less inclined they're going to believe. Mm. And then, then how are they going to invite somebody to a place they don't come to themselves? Mm. That makes sense. So you don't have services online? I do. That's what because we have a we have an audience outside of America, but all our folks come in. Because they, they get a delayed service. <laughs> oh, okay. So prayer meeting, right, is in person. That's why I do one at 12 o'clock because we got seniors who don't want to drive at night. I get that. So I go to a 12 o'clock service with them. Then I do a 7 o'clock at night. 
everything is in person. And we want to cut off a lot of our online too for our members who are in a local. Because they got used to it. And then when they heard me start saying it, they start coming back out. Because they're going to miss something. Because after you miss it, you can't get it back. So part of the problem is a lot of folk are still online. And the more you're online, what, what, you, what, what, you make, it, you, you make it more convenient to just stay home. Because how, cause how am I going to invite somebody if I'm not showing on myself? That's right. It makes sense. You, you can't. Come join us online. Listen, I hate Zoom because people turn their camera off. You know what they do. <laughs> you think you got 20 people listening. Everybody you're looking at their picture. They can be downstairs cooking. <laughs> In the bathroom somewhere. They can do a whole. Then, then, then they know you about to wrap up. They turn the camera. Hey man, Pastor. <laughs> like, yes! Yes! <laughs> Them jokers ain't got nothing you said. <laughs> so, so there's some guilty ones in here, anyway. <laughs> right? But 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 you have to. So so at church, we have fellowship meal and then we do some in the afternoon. So to, to kick off the lethargy. The, the lethargy, excuse me. And so we do stuff to come to the church, so that's why we have, so every month we have at least two or three community events, all right? So we stay active, getting folk to come. And you can't get this stuff online, yeah. it's not recorded, right? So when you hear people talking about it, you miss it. I have stuff even for my seniors to do. My mama is almost 80, so she's my plastic, she made plastic bags, her, her, her senior crew, they call them the Golden Girls, they make plastic bags for the food, for the food drive. So everybody got something to do. I'm gonna make sure everybody got something to do. So, so, but I don't do no, uh, I don't do none of that stuff. My folks like, can we do Zoom? Nope. Nope. I ain't doing nothing online. When COVID stopped, so did I. <laughs> I sure did. Right? I don't do nothing. I don't do no trainings. I don't do nothing. I ain't get online in the conference. I turn my camera off. I be doing all type of stuff. I hate Zoom. Did I tell you I hate Zoom? <laughs> yes, ma'am. But there's always a, there's always people who appreciate that mm -hmm. aspect of having mm -hmm. to be, you know, because they may not want to come out or they can't come out as much as they would like to. So I guess from the from the church perspective, how can I, I get the understanding of fellowship? Because for, for these kids, they need to know social interactions. They need to know and see mm -hmm. because they're not engaged in Zoom. Right. They definitely aren't. So, but the older, it's mostly the older. We have a van ministry to pick people up. So we bought a van to pick people up. We make everything. One of our other moms says, let's take out every excuse. Yeah. <laughs> we take away every excuse. We got a van. So so, so this morning, the lady called me when I was in the hotel. And she was like, is it too late to get the van? I said, no, call no way. He'll get you today. We don't turn nobody away. That's good. Even during the week. You need, you need to get picked up. Because I have, I, have, I, I have, this is the church cell phone number. It's a church cell. I got my own cell. So I got two 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 phones like I'm a dope dealer. It's like I'm me two phones. Don't worry about it. One is for salvation and one is for me talking kinky to my wife. Right? <laughs> right? So 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 people call this phone and then from there I tell them what, what's needed. She called me soon I'm walking to my hotel today. She said Pastor it's too late to get a ride on the van. Nope. Call Lloyd, Lloyd picking up people. Between Lloyd and my son, they, they pick up people. And we, we drive about 100 miles every side, picking up folk. It's because we want to remove every, because listen, there's some older folk who at home by themselves that need fellowship, too. They need it, but they don't have where to get there. So we all have members who are stationed in that area, we have to pick them up. If, if I'm the father of the church, then I got to make sure everybody's taken care of. Yeah. And everybody knows that. I'm, I'm, I'm the father of the church, right? I got to make sure all of my kids are taken care of from the oldest to the youngest. So if you need a ride, they know to call me. And the pastor will get me there. All right? You're going to get me there. So no matter who you are, what you are, we're going to get you there. Listen, you can't stand in the van, but we got we got steps to get you in that board. Right. We sure do. <laughs> So, so we want to make sure that everybody, because you're not going to kick the, the, the lethargy 
by being at home. And then we start inviting people to the church. You don't come to the church. So you gotta change that. I tell young preachers that. They lose their membership by, 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 by having all these prayer meetings on Zoom. Because then you can't, you, how do you know somebody's learning? You don't. How do you know they're soaking it in? You don't. All right? You don't. Yes, sir. I thought about something. What about the teachers? Uh huh. Do I say? We don't want to be professionalized. Because then people don't rely on those people, not us. That's what they get connected to. <clears throat> they get connected to that evangelism team. Yeah. And they spend all this time with them. And then they leave. And then so do the people. Whereas we, I train them to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, for us, it's a lifestyle. Yeah. It's something that's ongoing. Right? This, we have our own little radio station, too. Mm -hmm. it, only go, it only go a mile. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I can say we got a radio station. Amen, somebody. As <laughs> soon as you hit that mile, you're going to get us. Don't go past that mile, you're going to lose us. <laughs> That's straight up. Like, man, y'all got a radio station? Like, yeah. If it go off, I don't tell them why. It went off. Man, I don't know what happened to you. <laughs> in my mind, you went past that mile. <laughs> if, if you had stayed in that boundary, you would have heard it. <laughs> And it's free. It's free. We bought an antenna from Walt from our Amazon. <coughs> Got a little station because they have free stations you can just tap into. And and we, you know, my media people, they connect to our service. So yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. We're we gonna pray. And then I'm gonna give you the feedback. And then I'm gonna let you go. Is that all right? All right. My Father, praying for Adamsville and Fairfield that you will bless them, Lord, above measure. And help them, Lord, to be more than what they are used. Pastor and our first lady as they lead the charge. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, any, any, any other questions? Let me just say this. You, you all have, so I walked around your facility, you have a nice church. But you can improve it to bring to be excellent. In my church, we have a motto that says we're better together and we're striving for excellence. And the wife says, high to the highest what God's children should strive for. Okay? Which means that, that there should be excellence seen the moment you step in the parking lot. Alright? So, so please take my loving criticism kindly. Amen. And I don't mean to be bold, but I ain't got to come back. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Right? So when you walk in, your vestibule is too crowded. You got too much stuff out there. You got too. You got a pew out there and a table. You got too much stuff out there. It's too. It's too small for that. For all that. Because if it's if it's five people out there, it's crowded. And the fire marshal may tell you that's a fire hazard anyway because it, it doesn't have a clear projection. For one, so you might have something small enough. With, with some, if you have a grid out there, which is a great idea. But that that little. Podium y'all have on there, use that. Alright? Because you don't want to clutter. Like don't get rid of the table. And that pew. I know some of y'all got some pews that y'all love. Take it home with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I tell my folks. You love it that much? Take it home. But but it's a little color. This is a beautiful color. But it's not home. It's not it, it, there's no pictures on the wall. And you got white Jesus everywhere in a black community. You got a white Jesus. Y'all, he's gone from the cross. That's Catholicism right there. He's not on the cross anymore. I know the picture you're trying to, but you remember, I'm a visitor. So if I'm seeing a black church with Michelangelo, it's, it's make me think I'm different. Because you want your community to reflect. So when we give our steps to Christ, I'm in a black community. I give out the black steps to Christ. Right? That makes sense. So, so, so you want to have some paintings or something in your, in your sanctuary because when people see it, they'll say, okay, you can have spiritual writings, you can have anything. Right? And so, it's a nice sanctuary. It really is. It's really nice. 
you know, it's nice stained windows, but just the pictures on it. Yeah. Are, you know. That's, yeah. <laughs> now your exit sign is supposed to light up. So if a fire marshal coming, you hit fire mm -hmm. because it's supposed to light up. Does anybody know that if the power go off, that those lights come on? Did y'all try? You got to make sure that works. So one of the things we did, Pastor Carlisle, we had a we had a church cleanup day. And one of the things I said to the folk is anything that's under 2020, no no, 2018, it's gone. Yes, more than that. If you want to keep it, take it home. And you mean like publications of publications. Some, they had some exceptions we wrote to 1973. Oh, Lord. I said, what y'all keeping these for? All right? So when people walk in our church, we want them to look around and say, man, God, have a nice facility. Mm -hmm. Even when you go down and say, so, so we have a decorated committee. Every one of our rooms has been decorated, even the bathrooms. So when you go in the bathroom, it feels like, man, I don't want to leave this place. <laughs> Compared to, I can't wait to get about this place. Right? So you want to make sure that your bathroom are decorated. Your, you know, the stuff that's down there. Now, I, I believe in, in nice, smelly stuff. Not old moldy, right? So you want to make sure that when these people, whatever place they go, they can smell a sweet aroma. I like a wine breeze, right? Because remember, a visitor will, will leave and never come back. We get used to what we see, yeah. right? That's what we get used to. We get used to what we see. Not for us to pass the study there, but y'all need to build a brother a big one. It's, it's, it's hot. You can't go stand there. So I was up there in that room. I was like, man, maybe you can go up there, but it's, it, I don't know if you get air right there. You get to be up there. Right. You should have, I don't know about this community, but you should have glass doors. If y'all close that door, how do y'all know coming in here? Is this 100% is this safe out here? It can't be because y'all got an alarm system. <laughs> I hear that door, chain, chain. But how do y'all know who coming in here? People go in churches now and shoot them up. So if that door is closed, and my sister, what's your name? You must got a gun on you. Because <laughs> <laughs> the people in the back got must got the gun, right? <laughs> She's like, I got a fist. <laughs> but but if if how you don't come to that door? That's right. If you don't have anybody out there for one, mm -hmm. and two is closed. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about safety now. Yeah. I got armed security in my church. Three of them. Right? But how do you know That's fine. when that door is closed and you got kids, you got to watch out for purpose. That's right. Amen. 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 You don't know who's sneaking in or what or what. Y'all with me so far? Amen. So even your classrooms should be decorated. Even the place where we ate, the fellowship hall, you got to put some, 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 some hands on it. Right? And make it look like, hey, man, this is a place I don't care how, look, you can make anything small look good. Y'all got, what's that mustard down there on the wall? Colors of wall down there will be ate. If you can't name the color, that's a problem. <laughs> 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 it's, 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 <laughs> you can't the same one who's eating it. <laughs> If you can't name the color, it needs to be changed. <laughs> Amen, somebody? <laughs> the color of the wall, yeah. <laughs> what color is the wall? <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> because over the years, we get what? We get used to it. Because the first thing my wife asked me, how does the church go? I said, I'll call you later. <laughs> <laughs> So I call them that. Because we big on when we go to churches, what they look like. Right? We was at a church last week. I was like, oh, honey. I was like,
like, don't make a face. He's like, don't you make a face. <laughs> and it was 10 people there. Church is dying. Right? 10 people. Can't afford the church. But it don't look homely either. Meaning it don't look like, you know, people live. When people come to your church, you want them to believe that, hey, man, I'm invested in this church. Yeah. Right? This is my church. Like, if I come to some of your homes, I guarantee you the pictures on the wall, this, that, and that, has a nice, I hope, anyway, right? <clears throat> Same thing here. So start in an area, get rid of the stuff. We have stuff as well. Older people like old on stuff. Amen? Amen? They do. They do. But you got to think, is the, church, is the church antiquated? So if I'm out here and I'm dying to get to the service, I'm not going to know where it's at. You can have a little small TV right there. Or, or at least a speaker so people can hear in the vestibule and even downstairs in case the people in the kitchen are Getting food. You don't want them to miss a service. So I'll put a TV in the kitchen for my folk. Well, we, we see it. We had one back then. We had one by that. COVID did, I think that's when that counted. Yeah, but we did have a TV down in the kitchen. The speaker always speaking. Okay, get it back, back, back up. Get it back up. Yeah, 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 get it back up. Yeah, yeah, listen, when the treasurer speaks, you can spend money. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Amen. Hey, you heard that, right? Now you can hold them accountable. You said you're going to do it. Let me tell you something, y'all. The biggest problem in the church is fighting with the church budget. Let me give you this principle I need in my church. The church's checking account is not your account. It's God's. That's right. How you spend money at your house is not you're supposed to spend money with God. God expects it to be spent and used. That's why people get it. If people don't see you spending the money that you put in, people don't stop giving. So my folk at first weren't giving no money, but I started changing the, the landscape of the church. And the more I change it, the more they start giving because they didn't know it's going to be used for the right reason. Are you with me so far? See, we think that the church account, the treasure, I don't know about you, right? That it's their money. It's not. It's God's money to be used for ministry. And if we're not using it for ministry, what are we using it for? Right? So, so it's, it's almost impossible, listen to me now, this is common sense, to have a, to have a budget. Because you're always going to bust the budget. Because if somebody needs help, what you going to say? Well, the budget don't allow that. you got to help them. So I told my folks, listen, stop trying to get a budget together. We, we know what the bills are every month. Let's make sure we pay all the bills. And here's what we need for ministry. That's your budget. Stop trying to put a, a, a defined number on it. Because it's going to be busted because whatever may come up. So our van transmission went out. Five grand. Now, the church gave me like, that's outside the budget. So she's like, all right, Pastor, I'm going to write this check. Exactly. See what I'm saying? So, so the church checking account is not yours. I'll say amen for you. <laughs> it's not yours. And we treat it like it's ours. And some of us don't balance all as well anyway. Right? So, so you got to understand that it's meant for ministry. And watch what God does. Downstairs, listen, y'all got a lot of room. I was over here this other side of the church. I was like, man, y'all can really utilize that space. You didn't realize that? I wish I had that right there. I would turn, I would set that mother out. That tends to right? I would set that mother out. Right? I don't know what WBPN means. Yeah. Who is Kim? Right oh, she right there. Yeah. How often do you use that? Yes, ma'am. Um, it's frequently enough just when we have programs and things like that for the children throughout the summer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So, so I would use that for all sorts of things. Besides that, there's a lot of space over there. That's still usable. You can, you, listen, you can do community events right there where they don't have to be inside your sanctuary. Make it nice and appealing and call it a different wing to the church. So when you have your meeting, call it the, 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 the what's your name? It's Jeff, right? Yeah. Call it the Jeff side. <laughs> so folks come up them steps and go in, or WBPN, whatever it's called, 
right? Yeah. But, 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 but get that together. Get those rooms together over there. And when people walking in, because I, I was amazed at what I saw. It was at Fairfield. I was like, man, that's a nice big old church. I mean, it's on a hill. Good night. <laughs> I said, man, I parked my car and was leaving like this. <laughs> I was like, what in the world? Where we at? And you're walking up 90 steps. Stare where the heaven. Just don't fall. Right? But it has nice size. I really haven't walked all the way through. I think you took me in the sanctuary and some rooms. It just, listen, it just needs a human touch. That's all we need. Amen? Yeah. Huh? We, we plan it. You plan it? We talked about that a week or so ago. Man, I'm like, yeah, I might take you back too. <laughs> I'll take you back too. We talked about that. Good. We talked about it. Yeah, you, listen, you have to. I'm going to tell you something. We started spending money on our church. Here's what we did. We call it the sacrificial offer. We asked for people to put aside $25 a week for a building. And we and all I needed was 100 people to put $25 a week up. That's $2,500 right there every month that's going to go towards the building. You may not have 100 people. We got 200 plus people. But I knew that of that 100, somebody's going to do more than that because it always is. So you may have 30 people who say, hey, can you put aside $20 a month? Or twenty dollars a week, or whatever you want to do it. But but that thirty people at twenty is how much a week? Six hundred. Six hundred dollars, right? Six hundred times four is twenty-four hundred. So you got twenty-four hundred dollars to do something to your building. And you got to understand that people will give when they know there's a this when they start seeing it. Amen. You don't have to even do 20. You can do $10. That's $300 a week. Yeah. Everybody can put, I mean, most people can put $10 a week aside. But give them something that's tangible that they can touch. 30 people at $10, that's $300. 300 times 4 is $1,200. Now you've got $1,200 to do something with one project. And then when I do, I give my folk prices. All right, y'all, we, we got this right here. It's going to cost us. $2,000. I just need 10 people to do $100. I got 1000 right there. So now I'm halfway there. So, so because I, I need to get stuff done. I'm meticulous in my looks with stuff. I want people to come to my church and be like, man, I love this thing here. And everybody who's coming to my church says, man, y'all got a beautiful church. 